Today it's going to be self-contained. The first hour will take 65 minutes, then we'll take a break, and the second hour will take about 45 minutes. So next week we have the workshop on optimization and algebraic geometry, and a mathematical theme that links the two is convexity. So I will tell you about convex algebraic geometry. By way of... You want to change the... The projector looks pretty green to me. Any... Yeah. Yeah. It's got like some type of um, filter on it. Hmm. Okay. That's what it is. <laughs> Suppose you have m points in the plane with coordinates u, i, v, i. The m ellipse is the algebraic curve given by this equation. The set of all points x, y, where the distance sum to a given point, so it's the set of all points such that the distance sum to the m given points is d. Everybody knows the one ellipse, that's the circle. Everybody knows the two ellipse, that's the ellipse, algebraic curves of degree two. <coughs> the three ellipse is an irreducible algebraic curve of degree eight. The four ellipse is an irreducible curve of degree 10. Right. So this is the ellipse, it's a convex curve. It's an algebraic curve in the sense that there's a polynomial that vanishes on this curve, an irreducible polynomial for random black points. If the radius is small, you know, it need not encircle the points. The five ellipse is an algebraic curve of degree 32. So we can ask some questions about this object. So what is the algebraic degree in general as a function of m? What's the best way to write down the equation of the ellipse? Here you have a heat diagram that shows the three ellipse for three given points as the, various, as the radius varies. Right? So it looks like these curves are smooth unless they pass through one of the three cities. So we're given three cities in the plane. And one optimization question you could ask is what is the smallest radius for which the m ellipse is non-empty? Okay, so right there in the middle there's a, a unique point that's called the Fermat-Weber point. Very, very classical object, a very classical facility location problem, right? So you've got three cities, where should you build the factory? Right, so, okay, so three cities. Um, you know, Seoul, Dijon, Busan, where should you build the factory? Well, you build it where the, maybe the sum of the, the distance sum is minimal, okay? So how to compute that? Here's the same picture in a 3D view. So we now plot the same picture in X, Y, D space. And then uh, the ellipse itself is this convex funnel-shaped cone here in the middle. This is the ellipse for fixed value of D. If you take a ball, you drop it in the funnel, it comes to rest at the Fermat-Weber point. That's the point at the bottom. Now, when you write the algebraic equation that cuts out this surface in three space, and you ask Mathematica to plot it, it will also plot this other stuff. So this other stuff are other real points where the same polynomial vanishes. So I write down an irreducible polynomial that vanishes here, it also vanishes there. That is the Zariski closure of the ellipse. Let's start giving some answers. So for example, for three foci, uh, this is the representation that I like. I'm writing the ellipse as the determinant of a symmetric 8 by 8 matrix whose entries are affine linear in x, y, and as well in d. You can see that. So the determinant of this 8 by 8 matrix is a degree 8 polynomial, and that is the ellipse. So here is the ellipse. So these are the three cities. Here is the ellipse for some radius. Now the Zariski closure is given here in color. So on my screen this is red and green and blue. And uh, these are the other points that where this curve, where this polynomial also vanishes. So this curve is an irreducible curve of degree 8. Now, Here's a miracle about symmetric real matrices. A real symmetric matrix has all eigenvalues real. This partition of the plane indicates the signature of that matrix. So for every point in the screen plane, every point x, y, let's say the radius d is fixed, there's going to be an 8 by 8 matrix. Here in the middle, 
all eight eigenvalues are positive. So this is the region where the ellipse, where the, the matrix is positive, semi-definite. On the boundary, one eigenvalue becomes zero. In this region, we have seven positive eigenvalues, one negative eigenvalue. Six positive, two negative. Five positive, three negative. Four positive, four negative. Okay? So this is a the partition of the plane. So the curve is given as the set of all points x, y, such that this matrix is positive semi-definite. For the algebraic geometrists like you, having this determinantal representation means we're picking a line bundle on the curve, right? Because on each smooth point on the curve, this is a rank 7 matrix. The kernel is a one-dimensional space. So this is the, uh, the determinantal representation. After 44, after 32 comes 44, and after 42, 44 comes 128. So here's a little theorem. The polynomial equation that defines our ellipse has degree 2 to the m if m is odd. That's the case, the kindergarten case of the circle. And then 2 to the m minus the central binomial coefficient if m is even. That's the middle school case of the ellipse. The key point here is we express this polynomial as the determinant of a symmetric matrix of linear polynomials. Okay? Now, our representation of this extends this determinantal representation. For example, to weighted M ellipse, everybody knows that Dijon is much more important than Poussin and Sol, so we give a higher weight when we, to, to Dijon. Um, and in any dimension. So you can look at M ellipsoids and arbitrary weighted M ellipsoids in arbitrary dimension, and this is a reference. So I use the example of the ellipse to illustrate, to give you a first introduction to the field of convex algebraic geometry. So convex algebraic geometry is the marriage of real algebraic geometry, that is to say, algebraic geometry over the real numbers, with optimization theory. The objects we study here are convex figures, well, such as ellipses and ellipsoids and many more. And the theorem, in essence, says that the ellipses are spectrahedra. So we've realized ellipses and ellipsoids as spectrahedra. We're given a, a symmetric matrix with linear entries, which is positive semi-definite if and only we're in the ellipse. Is there any question about ellipses? Everything clear? How do you compute this uh, matrix? There's a, there's a theorem. So there's an inductive process by tensor operations. So you build big matrices out of small matrices using tensor sum and tensor product. So there's a mechanism that builds bigger matrices. So some of you in the afternoon tried to get rid of square roots. That can be done at the matrix level by certain tensor operations. No, yes. Word spectrahedra. I don't know this. Okay, I'm going to define it right now. Oh. So a spectrahedron is the intersection of the cone of positive semi-definite matrices with an affine linear space. So we're in the ambient space of n by n symmetric matrices. Um, that's a, a real vector space of dimension n plus one choose two. And inside this space, we have a full dimensional convex cone, the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. And a spectrohedron is what you get by cutting that with a linear space. So it's a convex body or convex objects like that. Of course, this cone is important in statistics. These are exactly the covariance matrices in for Gaussian, for n-dimensional Gaussian distribution. So for a statistician, each point in this cone is a, a normal distribution in dimensions. Semi-definite programming is the computational problem of maximizing or minimizing a linear function over a spectrohedron, and that's going to be a key topic next week. So Semi-definite programming and its applications. A very, very special case of this is linear programming. If your linear space consists of diagonal matrices, well, a diagonal matrix is positive definite if the entries on the diagonal are positive. So in that case, this cone is just a non-negative orthant. And uh, a polyhedron, convex polyhedron, by definition, is the intersection of a non-negative orthant with a linear space. 
The computational problem of maximizing a linear function over such a polyhedron is called linear programming. So linear programming is semi-definite programming for diagonal matrices. Semi-definite programming is the non-abelian version of linear programming. Diagonal matrices multiply in an abelian fashion, general matrices don't. So you can think about this as a non-abelian linear programming. Okay? Duality theory, very, very important, both in geometry, in optimization, and in convexity. So this picture in red is the example of a two-dimensional spectrahedron of degree three. Suppose you take the six-dimensional ice cream cone of positive semi-definite three by three matrices and you cut it with the two-dimensional plane, the white or yellow screen plane, okay? Then in that yellow screen plane, the spectrohedron will be this closed convex body, okay? The boundary curve is a cubic curve, right? It's the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix restricted to the screen plane. It's a cubic curve. Cubic curve is an elliptic curve. Next week, after this coming week, there's a cryptography workshop at NIMS. So far all the lectures are announced in Korean. We're trying to change that a little bit. Um, but elliptic curves, of course, are important for, me, for, the, for many applications, including cryptography. So here's an elliptic curve. In black, you have the Zariski closure, right? So this is a picture of a smooth cubic curve in the plane. Okay, let's do some semi-definite programming. Let's optimize a linear function over the red convex body. For example, the linear function go northwest. Suppose you don't know any algorithm, how can you solve an optimization problem? Well, you can use calculus, right? So in calculus, we list all the critical, we take the derivative, we list all the critical points, and then we pick the critical point we like best. Let's do it. So I'm going to sweep through, so I want to find, you know, the critical points for the objective function go northwest. I'm going to say beep whenever I had a critical point. Beep, beep, beep. Beep. I said beep six times. Four red, two red beeps on the spectrahedron, two black beeps on the Zariski closure, and two complex imaginary beeps you didn't hear. Right? <laughs> so there are six critical points, and then the one we like best is maybe the one over here. So that solves our semi definite program. In the bottom you have the dual picture, so this is in red, you have the dual convex body. So here you have a convex body, here is the dual convex body in the sense that you would learn in a class of Professor Holmson or Professor Chang in computer science. Okay? In algebraic geometry we have the dual curve. The dual curve, well, in this plane we have points and lines. In this second window, in this second plane, we have lines and points. Every point here corresponds to a line there. Every line there corresponds to a point there. The dual curve is the set of all points such that the corresponding line is tangent. Okay, so for example, if you, uh, you know, pick any red point here on this red curve, it represents, you know, a tangent line to this curve then by duality these outer branches get mapped inside so again points here correspond to tangent lines over there the singular points here they correspond to the hardly visible asymptotes so the three asymptotes that you see they are the singular points well this curve has degree three and class six six is the number of beeps this curve has degree six and class three Right, so class is the degree of the dual curve. Same picture in three space. So if I take my six dimensional positive definite cone, I cut it with a three dimensional plane, I get an object that looks like a tetrahedron but is slightly inflated. Um, so in statistics, this is the set of concentration matrices, three by three, covariance matrices with ones on the diagonal. And that is the logo, one of the four logos of the NIMS program. 
Here's the Zariski closure. You have the elephant ears going off. Um, there are four singular points that you can see. This is a cubic surface in three-dimensional space, a cubic surface that has a symmetric determinantal representation. The 27 lines on that cubic surface degenerate to nine triple lines. In red you have the dual picture. Here's the dual convex body. The dual convex body has two features. They are flat faces. They are flat two-dimensional faces. Think of them as four 501 coins. So you take four 501 coins, you make them touch pairwise. Those are the flat circular facets of this dual convex body. They are dual to these singular vertices over here. So here's a circle worth of linear functions that attains its minimum at this rank one matrix, this low rank matrix. Now if you stick your four 501 coins together there will be some air that you still need to fill in and that air is filled in by the quartic Steiner surface. So this is a surface of degree 4 that is dual to this cubic surface. So the linear functionals here correspond to maximizing at a point that's smooth. Okay, and then on the right is just the arrangement of the four planes dual to the four singular black points. Any questions about these diagrams? No. Uh, the, 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 cusp, the cusp point that uh, corresponds to what? Corresponds to a line that's, uh, that's asymptotic here. Uh, that line. That line, yeah. So if you move a little bit, the line will be tangent somewhere here, yeah. and that corresponds to a point down there. Mm -hmm. But this tangent line, so if you think about this as a point in the projective plane, um, you sort of have a, a, a double tangency and that leads to the cusp here. So at infinity there's a double tangency and that leads to a cusp. If you had a bitangent here you get a node and so on. Okay, That's, so those are spectrahedra. So spectrahedra are like polyhedra just better, much better. Semi-definite programming can be solved as efficiently as linear programming by interior point methods. However, the scope of applications is much wider. So a lot of engineers nowadays, including those on this campus, use semi-definite programming to model their problems. I got into this business by the problem of global minimization of polynomial functions. We practiced this in the course yesterday a little bit. So Suppose you have a polynomial in m variables with real coefficients of even degree 2d and suppose you knew that this polynomial attains a minimum x star on r to the m. It's bounded below and attains a minimum. Well then we want to find that minimum that's equivalent to maximizing the lower bound. Maximize lambda such that f minus lambda is non-negative. That's a very hard problem. We replace this problem by a similar but easier problem, namely maximize lambda such that f minus lambda is the sum of squares of polynomials. This problem is much easier both in the sense of complexity theory and in the sense of doing it and in the sense of numerical stability. So this is a semi-definite programming. Now we'll hear about this next week. So the optimal value of the STP often agrees with the global minimum. And if that is so, you can actually certify that. The global maximum for the dual STP has rank 1, and from that you can recover the optimal point. So here's what you do. You solve the corresponding semi-definite program by a primal dual solver. You look at the dual optimal matrix. You pray that the dual optimal matrix has rank 1. Suppose you're lucky it has rank 1. A rank 1 matrix looks like this. It factors as a row vector times a column vector and there's your optimal solution. That comes with a certificate. Small example, suppose 
You want to solve this for m equals 1, d equals 2 in one variable. You want to minimize the polynomial 3x to the fourth plus 4x cubed minus 12x squared. And suppose you never took calculus or it was so long ago that you forgot. <laughs> so how would you solve that problem? Well, let's try our method. We look at f minus lambda. We want to maximize the lower bound. We want to maximize lambda so this is non-negative. In one variable, non-negative is the same as being a sum of squares. A quartic to be a sum of squares means it's a quadric in quadrics, a positive definite quadric in quadrics. So we write down the row vector of monomials of degree at most 2. Column vector here, we make a general ansatz. We write this 3 by 3 symmetric matrix. That multiplies out to f minus lambda. Check it. There's one free parameter, mu, in the representation. So a quadric can be non-uniquely represented as a quadric in quadrics and mu is that one degree of freedom we have. Well now what I want to do, I want to find lambda mu such that this matrix is positive semi-definite and lambda is optimal. That's exactly the beeping problem. We have an elliptic curve in the plane, a cubic spectrohedron in the lambda mu plane. Rather than going northwest, we want to now maximize lambda. Right? We go beep, beep, beep. You type this into MATLAB. MATLAB solves this in 0.00000001 seconds and comes back with the optimal solution, negative 32, negative 2. You plug that into your matrix. Now the matrix is rank 2. That 3 by 3 matrix is rank 2. You Koleski factor that matrix as a 3 by 2 matrix times its transpose. You regroup and you see that f of x plus 32 has an explicit decomposition. The Koleski factorization gives you an explicit decomposition as a sum of two squares. So we have found that negative 2 is the global minimum together with a proof a certificate of optimality. So this is a numerical method that comes with a proof, a real Nullstellensatz proof of optimality. Now this has many shortcomings. That's of course in general only a heuristic, but uh, it works for a wide range of problems and it's an active area of research to exactly map out the range for which this works. Okay, I spoke fast for 23 minutes. And I apologize to those who came today because some of this was covered already yesterday. Now comes new material. So we have 42 minutes to go in the first hour. Any questions? Everything clear? Okay, let me tell you my favorite spectrohedron. Here it is. Let's look at this 6 by 6 Hunkel matrix. Some people, notably in a talk on Monday, will call this a generalized Hunkel matrix, but for me it's a Hunkel matrix. So a Hunkel matrix is a matrix whose rows and columns are indexed by ele the same elements in an abelian group, and where the entry in a given row and column depends only on the sum of the row label and the column label in that abelian group. Here the labels are 200, 110, 101, blah, 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 you know, 011, okay? Okay, so this defines a spectrohedron. So the set of all these matrices where this is positive semi-definite. That's a spectrohedral cone. So this is a 15-dimensional spectrohedral cone because they have 15 parameters lambda. So we're now in the 21-dimensional space of symmetric 6 by 6 matrices and we have our cone. Right? So we have our 21-dimensional cone of positive semi-definite matrices and we're cutting this now with the linear space through the origin of dimension 15 and the intersection is this spectrohedral cone. A spectrohedron that's a cone through the origin. Now, of course, in linear algebra, you know, if you slice an object with a linear subspace, over here in the dual space, this corresponds to a projection. 
right? When you took your linear algebra class in undergrad, right? So whenever you have a vector subspace of a vector space, you get, an, you get a projection, you know, you get epimorphism on, on dual vector spaces. So, so the corresponding projections goes from this 21-dimensional real vector space to this 15-dimensional real vector space. So this is the space of quadrics and quadrics and three variables, a 21-dimensional space. This is the, essentially the space or dual to the space of symmetric 6 by 6 matrices uh, with these row and column labels and this is quartic. So this is the map that takes a quadric and quadrics and makes a quartic. So it takes a 6 by 6 matrix to the corresponding ternary quartic. Now the image is a cone. It's a cone of all ternary quartics that are non-negative. Because all of those, according to one of the exercises yesterday, have a sum of squares representation and the algebraic boundary is the discriminant. So that's my favorite spectra. New topic. We'll come back to this spectra in a minute. Let's take a breath. So now comes a new definition that I want everybody to understand. Let's consider a compact Lie group. And my only example today is SON. Okay? So SON is the group of n by n rotation matrices. So n by n matrices that are rotations. That's a compact Lie group. Okay? You don't need to know what a compact Lie group is, but you need to know what SON is. Right? So, SON are orthogonal matrices that have determinant 1. Okay, so let's look at a representation of this group. Right? So representation is a homomorphism from this group into some possibly larger matrix group. And let's look at an orbit under this representation. So this group acts now on some vector space. Pick a point. Take the orbit of this point under the group. That's a variety. Right? It's a variety. Let's take the convex hull of that. That we call an orbitope. Okay? So the orbit, an orbitope is the convex hull of an orbit of a compact Lie group. Okay? Now these are well studied objects in the discrete case. So if we took a finite group such as the symmetric group then these are well-studied objects. So you pick a point, you take a highly you know, symmetric group, you move it around, and you get everybody's favorite convex polytopes. The permutahedron, various generalized permutahedra, the Birkhoff polytope, the traveling salesman polytope, many, many of the standard you know, combinatorial polyhedra that are of interest are discrete orbitopes, where the group is the symmetric group. But here we're in algebraic geometry. We want to do a more deal with a more continuous situation, so let's do this for SON. Okay? So the paper is with uh, Frank Sotila, who is absent but will speak at one, and Raman Sanyal, and it appeared a couple years ago, orbitopes. Example. Let's take SO3, the group of 3 by 3 rotation matrices. That's a three-dimensional algebraic group. This group acts on this 15-dimensional space of ternary quartics. Right? Homogeneous polynomials and three variables of degree 4. Pick a point in this space. So for example, this point. Right? So x plus y plus z to the fourth power, that's a point. Right? Those who study symmetric tensor decomposition like those points. Right? You want to take arbitrary points and decompose them into those points. Okay? That's an orbit. This orbit is called the Veronese variety. Okay, the real Veronese variety. Let's take the convex hull. We call that the Veronese orbitope. Now the quiz I wanted to ask whether this orbitope is a spectrahedron. Okay, I want you to understand the question. Maybe not know the answer, but is the question clear? Right? So I've given you an orbitope. I've given you a 15-dimensional convex body 
that is the convex hull of a say two three three dimensional variety the way I set this up here and I want to know whether this is an, a spectrohedron general question I give you a convex body such as Matt's coffee cup is this a spectrohedron right? no, that's a big question Spectrohedra are the good guys. If you have a convex body, and if your convex body is a spectrohedron, you win, right? Spectrohedra are like polyhedra, better. They're better than polyhedra. So if you see a convex body somewhere, and your convex body is a spectrohedron, then you're okay, right? And this one is, actually. The answer is yes, right? This is a set of all positive semi-definite Hunkel matrices, my Hunkel matrices, that essentially have trace 9. Okay, so I take the trace, I put in a fact of 2, you know, for just normalization. But basically the, these are the trace 9 matrices in my favorite spectrohedron. So if you take my spectrohedral cone, you cut with trace equals 9, you get a 14-dimensional compact spectrohedron, and that's the object we want. Okay? So a big open problem, a very, very big open problem in this field is to classify all SON orbitopes that are spectrohedral. Very, in my opinion, very good research direction. Would involve, you know, has tons of applications, very practical engineering application. We'll learn about them next week. And, and uh, it involves some very nice math, representation theory, and so this is a, a good open problem. Here's another orbitope, so-called tautological orbitopes. Okay. So suppose we have a group, SO3, right? SON. Well, SON acts on the space of n by n matrices by left multiplication. Is that clear? So the space of rotation matrices acts on the space of all matrices by left multiplication. Okay, let's pick a point. Let's take the identity matrix. Okay. Let's consider the orbit of the identity matrix under this action. That's the group. Right? So if I start with the identity matrix, I act with the rotation group, then the orbit is the rotation group. So I might as well take the convex hull. So the by a tautological orbitope, I just mean the convex hull of the group. Okay. So for example, the orbitope, the tautological orbitope of SO3 is actually a spectrohedron. So here's a little proof. Um, it's a set of 3 by 3 uh, matrices of this form that have this parametrization where UIJ, where the matrix U runs over 4 by 4 positive semi-definite matrices of trace 1. That's sometimes called the quantum simplex. So the people in uh, quantum information theory call that the quantum simplex. Here's a proof, okay? So, the positive semi-definite matrices having both trace 1 and rank 1 have uh, this parametrization, right? So this quantum simplex has this parametric representation and then the images under uh, the linear map up there is a parametrization of SO3. So this is the familiar double cover of SO3 by SU2. So every physics graduate student knows that you can double cover the rotation group by SU2, and that works. James Saunderson, who is a computer science graduate student at MIT, speaking on Thursday, proved this. He will talk about his proof of this result for any n. So Saunderson showed and will present on Thursday at NIMS the theorem that says for SON, the tautological orbitope is a spectrohedron and the dual convex body is also a spectrohedron. Let's do one more. Grassmann orbitopes. Okay, so now I take, in this example, I'm going to take uh, SO4, but this works in any case. So, so the Grassmann variety here is the variety of linear subspaces of a fixed dimension of R to the N. Okay. So in this example I'm going to take the two-dimensional vector subspaces in R to the 4. Okay. So, um, that's a five-dimensional um, 
It's a four-dimensional space. But I'm going to take the oriented version. So the way I set this up, I look at SO4. So those are 4x4 four four rotation matrices. They act on this six-dimensional vector space, the second exterior power of R to the 4 and by moving points around and I pick the highest weight orbit. Right? So yeah you guys have to just a little bit of representation theory. So you know there's a highest weight orbit for example any wedge of two of these elements. Okay so then that orbit is cut out. It's uh, cut out by two equations. There's the familiar Plücker relation that just cuts out decomposable tensors here but then the way we set this up over the real numbers, we get the equation for the five sphere. So this happens on the five sphere, right? So because we're applying the rotation group. So this is really the, the oriented cross magnet. So, so algebraic geometers, you always think about this in projective five-dimensional space, complex projective five space, I replace here by real, the real five sphere. Okay, okay let's take the convex hull. We call that the Grassmann orbitope. This particular Grassmann orbitope is the direct product of two three-dimensional balls, soccer balls, like the one you saw in the Croatia-Brazil game this morning, of radius 1 over square root of 2. So take the direct product of two soccer balls. That's a six-dimensional convex body. We're all clear what the faces are, right? You guys clear how to take the direct product of two solid balls? What the facial structure is? That's it. So let's prove it. So I perform a linear change of variables like this. So I introduce new coordinates u, v, w, x, y, z coming from these Plücker coordinates and uh, in the new coordinates the ideal becomes now very simple, right? It's u squared plus v squared w squared minus a half and then same in x, y, z and that reveals that it's the direct product of two balls, okay? Now what about higher Grassmannians? That is a subject in itself. So there's a literature in differential geometry, in differential geometry, called the theory of calibrated manifolds. And so in the study of calibrated manifolds, the basic classical question is, suppose you have some manifold in some dimension with boundary, in the differential geometric sense, and you fix the boundary, and you're going to glue in the manifold that minimizes the area or the volume. Soap bubbles right? have this property. Okay. Um, then to study these objects and to classify the possibilities leads to the study of Grassmann orbitals. So there's a literature called calibrations of calibrated geometries, which with hindsight is exactly the study of Grassmann orbitals. So, I say no more, but if you have differential geometers in the department, they probably know about calibrated manifolds. The facets are very, the faces of Grassmann orbitopes are very, very interesting, so they correspond to various, you know, geometries. Um, Taylor geometry, blah, 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 so it's a whole theory. So that's orbitopes. New topic. Any question about orbitopes? Rainer, by the way, wrote his dissertation to some extent about orbitopes. So he can answer questions. Okay. So, can I ask one thing? Yes. You mentioned uh, about some orbital which was expected, maybe it was this one, and yes. n, and the dual body was yes. also expected. Yes. Is that what you said? Yes. So this is unexpected? I mean, that is unexpected. So for so most, the, that, the dual bodies of spectrohedra in general not spectrohedra. And that, that is in fact a feature of the theory. That is not a shortcoming, that's an important feature of the theory. So it's rare for a, the dual of a spectrohedron to be again a spectrohedron. So polyhedra are closed under linear maps and duality, and that's a feature of polyhedral theory. But for spectrohedra, it's an important feature that duals are in general not spectral. Thanks for the question, yes. But this one is. Okay, a new and the last topic in the first hour this morning is the convex hull of a space curve. Let's reboot. If you understood little 
before you can tune in. All you need to know at this point is high school trigonometry, middle school trigonometry, whenever you study trigonometry. Okay. Cosine theta, sine 2 theta, cosine 3 theta parametrizes a curve in three-dimensional space. Okay, that's a closed curve, compact curve, right? Because pa theta runs over all real numbers, but after you're done with 2 pi, you get back to the same point. Here's a picture of the curve. Um, so I want to take the convex hull of this curve. Now before we discuss the convex hull of this curve, let's be clear about one thing, okay? Cosine and sine are really polynomials, right? I mean, anything that you can describe like this with cosine and sine, that's an algebraic curve, right? So here is the uh, algebraic description, so it's x, y, z, it's the intersect this quadric with this cubic, canonical curve of genus 4, right? So there it is. Okay, so that's a quadric intersected a cubic, and these are, these are polynomials. Now that's an important point, right? Because often people in applications, such as statistics, mm -hmm. people have models, or they have objects that they, the natural description involves, you know, exponential functions, or sines and cosines. First thing we do in algebraic statistics, it go from here to here. We get rid of the functions that look transcendental, and we turn them into polynomials. Okay? Now how do you do this? Well, let's look at this one. So z, you know, 4x cubed plus 3x. So, so this says, you know, cosine 3 theta is a polynomial in cosine theta, right? So I didn't know this. So my daughter, when she was maybe in 10th grade or something, she took trigonometry. 11, 11th grade, 10th grade. She took seven weeks of trigonometry. I didn't know there was seven weeks of trigonometry. So, so one of the things you learn in seven weeks of trigonometry is to take cosine of three theta and write it as a polynomial in cosine of theta. Okay, so that's what you do. These are called the Chebyshev polynomials. Okay. Okay. So here's the curve. Right. So it's in blue on my screen. So in blue on my screen, you go up, go up, go up, you dip down, you know, it comes back and then it's symmetric on the other side. Goes up again, comes down. Okay? So it's a circle embedded in three space. Now everything from now on, in the remaining 22 minutes, or the first hour, is together with Christian Ranestad. With a very nice contribution by Frank Sotila, Frank made this picture. <laughs> you can ask him. Okay. So, so this is the convex hull. So it's a convex body. Okay. Let's look at this convex body. So you sort of see three features in the boundary of this convex body. So the first thing you see is two flat triangles. Well, you see one of them, you don't see the other, right? So on top there's a flat triangle, and at the bottom there's another flat triangle. So that's a facet, two-dimensional flat facet. That's a triangle. Okay. Now how do you get this triangle? Well, you get this tri triangle from a tri-tangent plane. Right? So the plane that's spanned by this triangle touches the curve in three points. And that makes a triangle face. Okay. But then, more interestingly, you see the non-linear features in the boundary. This is a course about non-linear algebra. So we have linear algebra features in the boundary and non-linear algebra features. So, so you see these ruled surfaces, right? So there's a green surface and a yellow surface and they wrap around. So the green surface goes like this, the yellow surface goes like that, and they are ruled surfaces. They are one-dimensional families of edges of this convex body. So this convex body has edges. Um, and that's, that's it. Right? So there's a green surface and a yellow surface, so there's uncountably many edges of this polytope, two-dimensional, one-dimensional faces. Okay? So how should we describe this? Well, let's think about this. May one comment since Professor Holmesen asked. This is not a spectrohedron, by the way. So for a spectrohedron, every face is an exposed face. Okay, let me remind you of the definition of face and exposed. So polytopes, they're all the same. 
But in general, for convex bodies, you need a little bit more, you know. So a face of a convex body is a subset with the property that if you are in that set and you're on the segment between two other guys, then these two other guys are also in the set. That's the definition of face. An exposed face is a subset at which a linear functional attains its minimum. Okay? Every exposed phase is a face. And they are the same for polyhedra, but not in general. So in this one, this edge, the edge of this triangle, is a face, but not an exposed face. Right? Because you cannot find a linear functional that attains its minimum precisely on this edge. But as soon as you do that, you pick up the whole triangle. But as you go away by an epsilon, right, take a nearby edge, then it's exposed. Okay? And on a spectrohedron, all faces are exposed. It's an important feature. This is not a spectrohedron. However, it is a projection of a spectrohedron. Okay? So let me give you two ways to think about this object. So here is sort of what I would consider the engineering way. Okay? Well, in the applications and optimization, people often say, well, I have some complicated low-dimensional body. I have this three-dimensional, low-dimensional body. Maybe I can write it as a linear projection of some easier body in higher dimensions. Maybe I can lift it to an easy convex body in high dimensions. Right? Well, that's great. If I can do that, that and there's a whole theory. So there's many, 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 many recent computer science papers dealing exactly with this. Right? Whether you can take complicated traveling salesman polytope, you know, is there a good lift? And the same for spectrum. Okay? Now suppose you have such a high dimensional representation. Well then dual to the projection is an inclusion of linear functionals. So if you want to optimize a linear function over the complicated low dimensional convex body, we just map it in, you know, by the dual linear inclusion and optimize upstairs. It's the same problem. So for optimization purposes, this is a very, very, very good description. And here's a description, right? So this is a projection of a six-dimensional spectrohedron. Um, it's a Hermitian spectrohedron. So Hermitian matrices are just as good as symmetric matrices. The eigenvalues are all real. So, so I can write this object at the set of all x, y, z in three space, such they exist, u, v, and w, such that this Hermitian 4x4 four four matrix is positive semi-definite. And i is the square root of minus 1. Okay? So this is a Hermitian description. You can, you can get rid of the i and write this as a real 8x8 symmetric matrix. Okay, okay that's it. So this is uh, what some people call an LMI representation. Linear matrix inequalities. So this is a this is clear. So I've taken my object and I've written it as a projection of a six-dimensional spectrohedron in the space with coordinates x, y, z, u, v, w, and I project onto x, y, z space. Okay. Most people in polynomial optimization will consider this the answer. Okay. Some contrarians like me prefer a different description, right? I don't like this description for my algebraic view because I still don't know what's the yellow surface, what's the green surface. I want to know what are these surfaces. I want an exact representation of these surfaces and here they are, okay? So the yellow surface is the cubic surface we already know. The Chebyshev equation z minus 4x cubed plus 3x. The green Surface is irreducible of degree 16, and here it's its defining polynomial. Okay. Well, that's the irreducible polynomial that describes the green surface. So, so for me, this is part of an exact description. If I want to give an exact description of this object, I would like to know the green equation. And this is the green equation. Okay. Anybody who's ever tried computer algebra, that's a small polynomial. Okay. So, Any question? We'll discuss. I have a Macaulay 2 program. Okay? <laughs> so there's a program in Macaulay 2. So it, you type this in. First thing, it makes polynomials. Okay? And then it does a few things. And when you're done with it, you know, you get that. Okay? I'll get the question. <laughs> 
Is that clear? What I want you to notice is the two different perspectives on describing this object. So from the point of view of convexity and optimization, this is a very good description. From the point of view of sort of algebraic geometry and really understand what these objects are, I prefer this description. Okay. Before I tell you how we compute this, let me give you a theorem. Okay, well, some lectures require theorems, so let me give you a theorem. Um, let C be a general, smooth, compact curve of degree D and genus G in real three-dimensional space. It's a long sentence. The only hard thing about this sentence is the word general. That's the difficult part of the sentence. So let me explain everything else. Okay? So it's a curve in real three space, uh, but I think of it as a complex projective curve. Right? So always, always in applied algebraic geometry we have some object in real space that we want to study. We make the problem easier in three steps, replace the real numbers with the complex numbers. Makes the problem easier. Okay? Get rid of inequalities and then pass to projective space. Now the problem is so easy that we may be able to say something such as this theorem. Okay? So we have a curve in R3, but we think of it as a complex projective curve and it's smooth as a complex projective curve. So I, this theorem, I disallow singularities, including the ones you can't hear, or the ones that sit at infinity. Okay. Uh, compact as a curve in R3. So D, the degree, is the number of intersection points of this curve when I cut with the complementary plane. Okay. It's the degree of a space curve. The genus G is the number of holes as a Riemann surface. So, complex curve is a Riemann surface, it has holes, right, and G is the number of holes. Okay. So general, well, in the space of curves with these parameters, I want it to be general. Okay. General point or component of the Hilbert scheme, something like that. Okay. So I'm going to look at the algebraic boundary. So by that I mean the Zariski closure of the topological boundary, of the convex hull. Okay. So I take the convex hull in R3. Okay. That's a semi-algebraic set. Full dimensional, pure, three dimensional. Let's say the curve is not in a plane. Okay. Pure, three dimensional, semi-algebraic set. The topological boundary, that's a theorem, the topological boundary is a pure two dimensional semi-algebraic set in three space. The Zariski closure is a surface in 3 space. Complex projective 3 space to make it easy. Okay? And that I call the algebraic boundary. Okay? So that's the algebraic boundary of the convex hull. Well, the algebraic boundary has a nonlinear part in red and a linear part in black. Okay? Or oh, is it blue? Blue. Okay? So there's a, a red number here and a blue number down there. And the nonlinear part is what we call the edge surface. It's a surface of expected degree 2 times d minus 3, d plus g minus 1. Okay. That's the, the nonlinear part of the boundary. The linear part comes from the tritangent planes, and the expected number of tritangent planes is this number okay. over the complex solutions. Okay. So let me explain a little bit. So, well, a tritangent plane is exactly what you think it is, right? So I have a, a space curve, I look at triples of points, I look at planes that touch the curve in three points. Okay? Now, these things were studied classically. So, for example, there's a thick book by Joe Harris with Italian co-authors on algebraic curves. You go to that book, in the last chapter, in the last section, you find something called De Jonquière's formula, and then that's it. Okay? You derive it from De Jonquière's formula. Okay? So it's always good, you know, to let other people do the hard work. Okay? <laughs> so in red, same thing, you know, we we're looking for the degree of the surface, and this was basically determined again by algebraic geometers, Arondo and co-authors in 2001. So what's the edge surface? Well, I have a curve, in a space curve. Pick two points on the curve. Well, it's a smooth curve, so they're tan unique tangent lines. Okay? So these tangent lines either meet or they don't. Typically, they won't meet. Right? The two tangent lines won't be on a plane. 
But if you pick the two points special, they might meet. And so I call that a stationary bisecant. So if I take two points where the tangent lines meet, then the secant I call a stationary bisecant, and the edge surface is the union of all stationary bisecant lines. That's it. That's the nonlinear part in the boundary. Okay. Okay, for example, let's do d equals 4, g equals 0. So a genus 0 curve of degree 4. So if you plug in, the red number is 6 and the blue number is 0. Right? So a rational quartic curve is expected to have no tritangent planes, but it's going to have an edge surface of degree 6. Voila. Right? So again, Rational curves, you can always have a trig parametrization. Okay, so cosine theta sine da da da, right? That's this blue curve. So, okay, so there it is. So it's, you know, it goes down like this, comes up there, goes down, comes back. Okay? You can do this at home. This is basically the boundary of a Pringle. So, Pringle are potato chips, they're sold in Korea. Okay? So you can buy them at 7-Eleven and carefully wrap around saran wrap to make the convex and you can eat them too okay if you break them you know while you take the convex cell you can eat them so this is the boundary the algebraic boundary is this purple surface okay surface of degree six but of course this surface is highly single right it's single along the curve right? so the actual algebraic boundary is here you know but then you get the, the curve. So this is the exact description okay so this is almost answering Matt's question. I mean, basically, we sort of implemented this. Okay. Um, a word on singularities. So, uh, um, well, it's sort of open and general. If we have nice singularities, we have a formula. So we're going to look at ordinary singularities. So a singularity of a space curve is ordinary if uh, no plane intersects the curve with multiplicity more than four. There are two kinds. There are ordinary nodes and ordinary cusps. And modification of this theorem says the edge surface of a general irreducible space curve of degree d, geometric genus g, it has singularities, so now we need geometric genus, and n ordinary nodes and k ordinary cusps. Well, we take the old red number and we subtract 2n and 2k. So every ordinary singularity drops the edge degree, the surface of the, the degree of the edge surface by two. So let's do again the rational quartic case, but now with one singular point. So, well, in this case, the degree, the, the Pringle boundary had degree six, convex hull, the purple surface. Now we drop by two. So now we get a quartic surface. And that quartic surface is reducible. It's always the union of, union of two quadratic cones. Um, and in the cusp case, the, uh, the, the cone point of one of the cones is the cusp. So picture says more than a thousand words. So here's a rational quartic in white with one ordinary node. Okay. So here the white curve goes up like this, comes back. And you can write this with cosine and sine, you know, so that's the rational, a rational uh, curve, but now it has a self-intersection, right, that travels through itself. So you take the convex hull, now the algebraic boundary is the quartic that decomposes into two singular conics, right? So there's a red cylinder that has this cone point far out, it's a cylinder, right, really far, far, and then uh, here's another sort of cylinder that's in blue. So if you take two conics, right, so try this. So this morning I was trying, I actually had a hard time finding the Korean channel that showed it, you know, that showed the game. It was rugby and golf and, you know, all kinds of things. Eventually I, so in rugby or American football, they have a ball that's an ellipsoid or generalized ellipsoid, M ellipsoid. <laughs> so take a soccer ball and take a rugby ball, intersect them, but with a point of tangency. Okay, and then look at the intersection curve. That's this white curve. And now take the convex hull. 
The convex hull will consist of two conics. The boundary will consist of two conics, but they're not the conics you start with. Okay. Well, try it, okay? Take two balls, but let them not be both soccer balls. So take a football, you know, and a soccer ball, intersect them, and then you will see, you know, it's a good example to try. Here's the other case, you know, if you have a, a rational quartic with the cusp, then again, the algebraic boundary consists of two qu singular quadrics, but now one of the two quadrics, the red one, has its cone point on the cusp. Gee, I still have five minutes. Any questions? Any questions about the convex hull of a curve in three-dimensional space? I'm just curious where exactly the uh, the ordinary definition of, is this particular to the CP3 that we're living in for uh, the, so with the ordinary definition for a singularity point we, we said that it has no more than multiplicity or it has multiplicity four right no more yeah but on any plane yeah oh, right so so is this just depending on our ambient dimension or is this no this is well this is for curves in three space okay. yeah. right. But as always in algebraic geometry, you know, it's much more, I mean, if you want to, over the real numbers, things are always complicate. So we always do the definitions over the complex numbers. No case distinctions. Okay, with three minutes to go, well, the questions that everybody should ask, what about higher dimensional varieties and higher dimensional spaces? So let me wrap up by giving you a general theorem about arbitrary varieties. So this is going to be a little bit technical. So I'm going to go through and then we have a leisurely 10 minute break. X is any compact real algebraic variety in n space. For simplicity, we look at the complexification X bar in CPN. We assume it's smooth for now, as before. For every positive integer k, I'm going to look at the dual space. Okay? Points here correspond to hyperplanes there. Points there correspond to hyperplanes here. Okay? So in that dual space, I'm looking at all the hyperplanes that are tangent to my variety at k affinely independent regular points. Okay? So I'm interested in hyperplanes that touch my variety at k points, but I want them to be affinely independent, non-collinear. Okay? That's a set of hyperplanes, so it's a subset of the dual projective space. Close it up, you get a variety, I'm going to call that variety x upper k. Okay. Now, for example, x upper 1 is the usual dual variety. Okay, this is the set of all hyperplanes that are tangent at one regular point closed up. Okay. Now we have an inclusion, right? So x3 is contained in x2, is contained in x1, right? If you are tangent at three, you know, planes that are touch at three points are in the limit of planes that touch on two points, right? So it's obvious inclusion. So we have xn da, 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 sitting inside the dual variety. When you say, when you say uh, regular point, you choose complex points? Or Everything complex. Okay. Yeah. So for simplicity, whenever I refer to smooth and regular and all that, I refer to complex points. Okay. Now, for small k, now we double dualize. So we take x, and we dualize in the k sense. Now we dualize back in the 1 sense. Well, well, if we just take x dual dual, x star star, we get x back. So that's bi-duality. Bi-duality holds in convexity. The double dual of a convex body is the same. In algebraic geometry, in optimization, we always have bi-duality. Okay? So x1, 1, 1 is x. But we do x k1. Okay? So for small k, this is a low dimensional variety, it's the kth secant variety and uh, you, you know, and Luke knows everything about these objects, okay? That's the usual secant variety, okay? That's the one we're not interested in here, okay? We're going to be interested in larger values of k. So we write r of x to be the smallest integer k such that the kth secant variety is either hypersurface or filled space. Those are the k I'm going to be interested in. Okay. So I want to be smallest k that we're either filling space or at least our hypersurface. Okay. Well, then by dimension count, you know, this r is at least, you know, n divided dimension plus one upper floor. Okay. 
is a necessary condition for the object we're interested in to be a hypersurface. Theorem. The algebraic boundary of the convex body, the convex hull of X, can be computed by projective biduality using the following formula. I take all the values of k starting from the small r up to n, and I do this, x k star. Okay? By construction, these are all hypersurfaces. So I have finite union of hypersurfaces, so there's a unique reduced polynomial with real coefficients that vanishes there. Okay. Unique product of irreducible polynomials. Now what I would like to say is that the algebraic boundary is equal to this. Not quite true, but almost. This is the best approximation you can get by purely algebraic methods. This is a purely algebraic definition. You can compute this over any field. Okay. This you can do over a finite field, field with zero, one element. I mean, you can, any field, right? You can compute this, right? This requires ordered structure. This requires the real numbers, right? So for example, it could happen that you have these various hypersurfaces, but one of them has no real point. Well, you have to throw it out. Or maybe it has, this is a real hypersurface, but it's far away from your convex body. You have to throw it out. So, so to sort out which of these factors actually contribute, you have to do a subsequent computation using real root classification or semi-definite something that involves inequalities in real numbers. Okay? This runs in Macaulay over any field. But this is something that involves inequalities. Okay. Going over time, so uh, plane curves, classical story, you know, so if you take the boundary, the algebra, take the convex hull of a plane curve, well there are two features, right, there are uh, bitangents and then the parts that come from the curve itself, right, if you take a convex skull, so that's uh, x upper 1 star using x upper 2 star, so x upper 1 star, that's x itself, and then here you get x upper 2 star for the bitangent. Space curves we discussed, right, so the lower bound here is 2, so the algebraic boundary is x2 star, those are ruled surfaces, and x3 star those are tritangent planes. Let's end the first hour with a discussion of four 501 coins. So if you take, you can do this at home, so you take four coins of equal size and you make them touch pairwise in three-dimensional space. So it looks like a tetrahedron with holes. But now, rather than gluing in the red Steiner surface, we just take the convex hull as is. Right? You take the convex hull of the four coins that touch pairwise. Well, of course, that's the convex hull of a space curve, namely four circles. Right? That space curve is reducible and has singularities, but actually all of this more or less applies as well, and this is the Schlegel diagram of the convex hull. Okay? So, just to kind of visualize this, so there is, you know, one, two, three of my coins, and then the fourth coin out there. And then whenever you have a hole, there are four things glued in. There's a little triangle, so there will be, if you try, try this, take three coins, there will be a tritangent plane that makes a little triangle, triangle of face. For each of the four holes, there will be a triangle of face. But then there's also going to be an edge surface that's going to be a quadratic surface, right? So here's a little bit of a quadratic surface that's the same surface as over here. And then there's another quadratic surface over there. So you can try this in the break. I apologize and maybe I'll see you again in eight minutes.